Well, good morning and welcome to our 8 o'clock service at Christ Presbyterian Church. Um, so we actually have um, so a couple of very important announcements for you. Uh, we finally can confirm for you uh, that we will be having our very first worship service as a church family uh, in the new building at 901 Sisk two weeks from today. So August, yep, yeah, that's worth applauding about, absolutely. Uh, August the 2nd uh, will be our first service in. Now, as joyful and overwhelmingly um, uh, anxiety-producing that is, uh, we also know, because we got a lot of moving to do between now and then, that's going to be taking a lot of the staff's time, uh, it means we have to say goodbye to this space. Uh, and I, I just, I want to invite you into the morning uh, uh, that we've been doing as a staff, realizing that we won't be able to give um, this place a proper send-off. Uh, we had anticipated on a number of occasions uh, having a big cookout here and being able to sort of you know, uh, do some things, but we're just unable to. I, I do think that there's importance uh, in looking at a space that you've been involved in and being able to sort of properly send it off. Uh, but in lieu of that, uh, we do have something that was produced by our own Eden Flora as a small little print that we want to make sure that every single uh, household uh, at Christ Press gets one of these. It's in the basket right out here uh, in the lobby as you enter and exit. And it's just a print of the front of our building here, and it's something for you to have uh, so that we can memorialize all the ways in which God uh, has been in work uh, in this place. So grab one of these. Again, one per household for now. We'll probably have plenty of extra as we move forward if you want to grab some uh, for other family members and friends. But uh, these are for you. They're free. Uh, that's the best as we can do this week and next as we uh, sort of memorialize our time. Next week, there will be a slight inconvenience in that these green chairs will be gone uh, but we'll have some of our metal chairs that will be laid out for that. Uh, the moving will happen actually this coming week, so you'll see next week will look a little bit bare and a little bit different, but that'll be good. I also want to remind you that we are looking for people uh, to volunteer uh, as uh, media uh, assistants uh, for, uh, in, the, in the new building. Uh, as you know, Amanda Fleifelit runs our soundboard, and she'll be doing all the sound for the new building. But we need someone to help run projection uh, and screen. So we're actually looking for a team of people that can rotate through. Uh, the more people we have, the fewer times there is to volunteer. Uh, but we would love for people to be involved in that. And there'll be a, a training session. It actually won't be the one that we're doing as the staff, but that'll come sometime in the month of August as you hear about that. Isn't that right? Yeah, that'll come sometime later on. Um, so if you have any interest in that, please come and join us uh, for that as well. Um, we are very excited uh, this morning to have uh, our own uh, youth minister, uh, Scott Bird, who will lead us through our order of worship, uh, and our own uh, ruling elder, True Red, uh, will be leading us as the uh, elder of the day as well. So, Scott, would you come forward and welcome us this morning? Good morning. Our uh, call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 116. So, if you would please stand and hear God's call to worship. Uh, this is a responsive reading, so I'll read the part with the E beside it, and you'll respond in the bold. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of shale laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that through the blood of Christ you hear us. Lord, you hear our cries of pain and suffering. You hear our cries for mercy. You hear our cries of joy. You hear our cries for help. Lord, you hear us. And we find rest in you. Our souls find rest in you. Lord, we pray this morning that that would be true, uh, that, that 
you would hear our worship, that you would hear our praise. Um, Lord, you are the audience this morning. And we pray that, that you would hear us uh, and that our souls would find rest in you. Lord, I pray too that, that you would speak to us and you would give us ears to hear you. Lord, do that this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you can be seated. You know, for centuries, the church has used uh, catechisms to learn about who God is and uh, how he relates with his world. And so we're going to read uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, question number 61. I'll read the question, and then we'll respond in the bold. Christian, why do you say that by faith alone you are right with God? It is, it not, is not because, because of, of any value, value my faith has that, that God, God is pleased with me. With Only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, righteousness and holiness make, make me right with God. God. And, and I, I can, can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. Amen. Uh, this morning, there's actually a change in our schedule. Uh, the McConey twins will not be baptized this morning. Uh, hopefully we can get to that soon. Um, so we'll just go into our call to confession here from Hebrews 12. Uh, this call to confession shows us that God is not a God to be trifled with. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will they escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Please read with me the corporate confession of sin as we read together. Lord Jesus Christ, sin is my malady, my monster, my foe, my viper, born in my birth, alive in my life, strong in my character, dominating my faculties, following me as a shadow, intermingling with my every thought, my chain that holds me captive. Yet your compassions yearn over me. Your heart hastens to my rescue. Your love endured my curse. Your mercy bore justice. Let me walk in humility, bathed in your blood, tender of conscience, living in triumph as an heir of salvation through your blessed name. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in silent confession. Amen. If you will, stand and hear God's offer of forgiveness through Christ. This comes from Hebrews chapter 12, and this is, the author is uh, comparing life under the law uh, with life under grace. And so Sinai represents the law, Zion represents grace. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Believers, nobody can stand under the law. Nobody can stand in the presence of God. But through Christ, we can be in the presence of God with joy. You can be seated. 
our deacon, uh, Shannon Singletary, is going to come up and do our offertory prayer. Please pray with me, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for the simple things uh, like the sunshine coming up today and giving us another day to, to just be under your authority and uh, to be with you. Uh, dear Lord, uh, we pray that you will make us strong in our giving and serve in our church. And we pray that you will continue to teach us how to persevere during these difficult times and to persevere in a holy way, one that will honor you. Dear Lord, continue to, to bless this church during this transition. And we pray for, again, just the, the, the simple um, strength and the, the motivation and the energy that the leaders will need as they pack up and move. And, and we just pray that you will bring people and bring those helping hands that we will need to, to just make our, our new church home more than just a building, but a place that will be welcoming to, to others and, and to this wonderful community. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. My name is True Red. I'm one of the elders here at Christ Press. It's my privilege and pleasure to lead our congregational prayer today. Hebrews 4.16 encourages us. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Please pray with me. We come before your throne, Father, and find grace, and we know your grace is upon us all. We know your grace was extended to us who did not deserve it and with no way to earn it, and we know it is a costly grace at an unimaginable cost with your gift, the life of Jesus. And so, as we bow before you this morning, would you deepen the depths of our faith, Lord? Would you clear our vision and enable us to hear you in this time of prayer and fellowship with you? Lead us with your love, your power, and your wisdom. It is our practice to lift up to you each week our members of the week and our missionaries of the week. Tony and Tracy Boyd serve as our missionaries in Southeast Asia, and their pandemic position is distributor of food and essential supplies. They praise God for this opportunity to connect with many non-Christians, and they ask our prayers that these new interactions may bring many of those to Christ. Dr. Sean O'Bannon is one of our members of the week, and Sean asks our prayers that he be encouraged and embodied by the Holy Spirit daily, that others may see Christ in him, and that he may be joyful in all circumstances. He asks that his frailty, weakness, and sin bring Christ's mercy and show his need for him and dependence on his grace and mercy. He asks we pray for godly wisdom and direction for his life and business and to protect him from worldly advice and misdirection, however well meant it is. And he asks prayers that he may hear you, Lord, and obey and be thankful in all circumstances and for all things, blessings and hardships. Ellen and Alec Osorio are our other members of the week. They ask prayers for their marriage and that it helps them to continue to grow closer to Christ. They are thankful that both of them have been blessed to keep their job through these uncertain times, and they pray they are able to continue to work. They also ask prayers for Ellen's sister KK as she finishes up grad school and moves to a new city to start her new job. Remind us, Lord, to continue to lift our missionaries and members of the week in our prayers. There are times we grow weary, but we know our strength is at the foot of the cross. We know if we are praying, you are listening. Soften our hearts and let us hear your voice, Lord. Help us to live a life that pleases you. Help us to abandon our pride today. Help us to recognize the daily opportunities we have to serve you. Help us to use our God-given talents and help us to appreciate your undeserved blessings. Work within us and help us to consistently surrender ourselves, our lives, and our will to you. Thank you for your promise of a glorious inheritance in the name of Christ. We are thankful for Jesus and his salvation as we pray today. Help us to realize the magnificent privilege of prayer. We are in such uncertain times, Lord. Please give our leaders your wisdom as they maneuver the uncertainty of this pandemic and the outside challenges to our faith. But let us always be reminded we have hope, and that hope is in Jesus. Lord, help us to undergo what we do not understand and in the end overcome it all in the power of the cross. We know and we trust you are with us through this storm. We thank you as we begin to move into your new house, and we are excited to worship and glorify your name there as well. Thank you for all those who so diligently served in bringing this to fruition. We pray our church on the hill will radiate your glory to our community and far beyond. Help us to boldly go out and proclaim your truth. Because of your love, we exist. Because of your grace, we have the promise of eternal life. Your creation and your eternity. Help us to be dependent on your strength and not just our own. Let us know your peace, no matter the circumstances around us. Father God, may your Holy Spirit speak through less today as he brings us the nourishment of your preached word. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. 
And thus, we praise and pray in the name of our majestic Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now please follow with me as we read the scripture accompanying today's message. This is God's word from 2 Samuel chapter 6, 11 through 19. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. The word of the Lord. So it's been a few years back uh, since my mother <clears throat> had back surgery. Uh, she had some pain in her neck and some shooting pains down her arm, and turns out she had to have some corrective surgery to fix it. Um, and uh, I, it was relatively minor, but she needed to be in the hospital for a day or two. And I'll never forget going to see her uh, the morning after her surgery because she was so angry. I mean, mad as a hornet. And I stepped in, I was like, Mama, what's wrong? And she said, well, if I knew that I was going to feel this bad <laughs> after the surgery, I don't think I ever would have gotten it. And isn't that always the nature of surgery? Surgery is such where you always have to feel worse before you feel better. That's the way of things. Well, it turns out that that's a, there's a spiritual truth in that as well. Because as soon as you begin to say that I want to move in towards the presence of God, you suddenly find out that you're going to feel worse before you feel better. That's the path that we learned about last week. And it's very confusing for people who actually encounter Jesus for the very first time. You know, they'll have some sort of, um, I don't know, vague sort of sense of, uh, of maybe guilt feelings or, or some kind of a, a need for something fulfillment in their hearts. And they start to approach Jesus. But as soon as they do, it's as if the world falls away from underneath them because of what they find about the need of God's holiness to impact us with our need, so that we know it even better. So if you ever want to move from a religion that's kind of, from a Christianity that's more driven by superstition uh, into something that's authentic, or if you ever want to move from a Christianity that's about moralism and just sort of like trying to get yourself to do right things, it's going to go through this path. You have to take the bad news. And as it turns out in the passage that True just read, we have a great description of the mental and spiritual state that someone experiences when they go through this. And it's right there in verse 9. There you have King David sort of describing himself of where he is. And look what it says. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? You see what he's saying? David gets it. <laughs> The one thing I need the most to be and live and exist in the presence of God, 
I can't have it. How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? And so he's unwilling to, uh, to bring it back. Can you imagine the dejectedness that David must have felt? Can you imagine the embarrassment that he must have felt after putting on this whole big thing, his first official act as king, and it ends in the death of Uzzah? Look, here's the deal. It's almost, it, it's a hard and difficult truth that God uses the catastrophes in our lives, the heartbreaks in our lives, to bring us to this knowledge that actually when it comes to it, you're worse than you think you are. That we are weaker than we thought we were. That we're more flawed than we thought we were. That we are more unacceptable than we thought that we were. Moves us towards that. I, I can remember it for 25 years in campus ministry, I would encounter students. After I would interact with them, my staff and I would say, you know, I, I feel like that student just needs a storm. Why? Because God has to lead them in to this knowledge of coming to the end of themselves. And that's where David is at this moment. But here's the deal. <laughs> John Newton said very clearly, he said, you know, no one ever learned that they were a sinner by being told. <laughs> you have to experience it. You've got to go through the disaster for yourself. But what I want to encourage you is, is not to fight that feeling. Don't push away from that sensation because oftentimes it's you're at the very cusp of getting some very, very good news. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Because David thought that in order to get the presence of God into his life, that it was all going to be roses, but suddenly he's been given a severe mercy, like we talked about last week. But God was ready to show him now, now that he's in an entirely different frame of mind, that actually... The presence of God is something that I want to you to have. And it's a joy as you do. So David's path, David's path is still our path. The same journey that he took, we have to take ourselves. And so I want to look at that this morning simply by asking two questions. Number one, how did David enter in to the presence of God? And then secondly, how can we enter into the presence of God? Just those two questions this morning as we dive into it. First of all, how did David enter in? Well, I kind of think it's a tragedy uh, that for a lot of people, especially those on the outside of the Christian faith, um, their perception of the way Christians sort of take in their life is that it's kind of a, uh, a mildly aggravated depression. You know, well, you know, I mean, I'm a Christian, uh, and so I usually stay fairly dour and into myself. I'm a little depressed most of the time. I certainly don't assert myself in anyone's life. <laughs> That's not God's intention for the Christian life. Um, God's intention for his covenant people is not to walk around in defeat, but rather to sort of move into the presence of God. The very meaning of the Ark of the Covenant is that we can go in. God would end up saying to Moses when he built the first tabernacle, I will meet with you over the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. So the way that God showed him that he just didn't want him to go home and sulk for the rest of his life or the rest of his reign is what happens in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Now, honestly, I think this is the only comedy in this rather tragic story that we've read because you've had this huge parade. We're bringing the ark up. Suddenly it stumbles. Uzzah grabs it. Uzzah dies. The screams start. People panic. David is depressed. The ark of the Lord is never going to come to me. What are we going to do with this thing? I know. Give it to Obed-Edom. And he's got to be thinking, oh, um, actually, you guys could have it if you wanted it. Maybe we could find somebody else. But the ark actually goes to Obed-Edom's house. But here's the thing. Rather than being a dangerous curse to his house, everything starts going right for Obed-Edom. Everything. Uh, his kids suddenly get incredibly well-behaved. Uh, his investments, you know, soar, right? Uh, uh, his crops produce more than he ever thought that they could. Everything's going well. God blesses Obed-Edom and his house. And more importantly, he makes sure that David hears about it. He wants for David to know that it is my intention to bless you. I want and long to have fellowship with you, David, but it has to be on my terms. It has to be. And so in this parallel story that happens in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, uh, we find out exactly what it is that David does. 
<clears throat> and clearly what he does is he goes back and he searches through the books of the law. He does his research over again. And again, it, it's impossible to sort of get specifically into David's mind about what he was doing here. But I'd like to believe that he went back and began to study the tabernacle and figure out exactly what this, this Ark of the Covenant really meant. And, of course, we looked at this last fall in our look through Exodus as we talked about the importance of this uh, symbolic uh, 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 furniture that God asked for his people to place. And if you'll remember in your mind's eye the, the, the outlay of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant was very much in the back. That was the destination in the back of the worship tent. But as you walked through the outer gates of the tabernacle, the very first piece of furniture that you encountered was an altar. In other words, David knows where he wants to be. He wants to be back there. He wants to be at the ark. But he suddenly realizes that you cannot get to that without going through a place of death, without encountering a place of blood, a, a place of sacrifice, but also a place of, of substitution a place of, of atonement. And it is as if the lights in David's heart come on. Suddenly he gets it. And bravely, he decides that he's going to put on another parade. And so he combines what he found out about, what, what he experienced with Uzzah, with what he's just discovered in Obed-Edom, and he decides to put the record right. So what does he do? He starts over. The Chronicles account tells us that he actually does go and get the Levites, the, the, the tribe that was only supposed to handle and transport the ark. He goes and gets them. And he has them go through all of their consecration rituals that God had asked them to back in the book of Exodus. The second thing that he does is he starts to make his way up to the Temple Mount, which was up on a hill there in Mount Zion. And you see something really weird in verse 13. Look what it says. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. Hey, I hope you've heard me say that when you're studying the Bible, one of the things that you need to sort of, that ought to jump out you, <coughs> at you, are what we might call weird details. Okay? That's a weird detail. Why was it important that David only took six steps before he stopped and had a sacrifice with the parade. I think the answer, and I found this at one commentator had said, is that for a Jewish person, numbers are very significant. You've heard me say this before, too. Well, the number seven is, in the Hebrew mind, almost like a whole number. It's a number of wholeness and completion, a number of perfection. So do you see, it's almost as if David is saying, you know what? We are not going to make any real progress on this journey until we pause and remember the only thing that makes this journey possible. Stop! We're doing another sacrifice. Can you imagine <laughs> the bloody trail that must have led up whatever street they were get, uh, uh, moving through as they headed towards the Temple Mount? Sacrifice after sacrifice. And of course, the type of offerings that he, that he was doing are what are known as burnt offerings. A burnt offering was a very specific kind of offering that came to the people of Israel, where you would take the animal, and the person who was preparing the sacrifice would lay his hands on the head of the animal. The meaning of that symbolic action was to say, I am identifying with this animal. This creature is going to bear the weight of my sin. God is going to treat this creature as if, or like unto, <laughs> they are me. There was a transference. There was an identification. This will be utterly, utterly destroyed so that I don't have to. There was identification with the sacrifice. You know, it reminds me a lot of a story from the Old Testament, from the book of Numbers. In Numbers 21, we have a story of the people of Israel as they're journeying towards the promised land, getting rebellious again, <laughs> as they are wont to do. And on their way, God decides that he's going to bring judgment by allowing snakes to enter the camp. You remember this story? The snakes come and invade the camp. They begin to bite the people. People are dying in droves. And so Moses, as he also is wont to do, goes before the Lord to plead on their behalf. 
Well, God tells him that he's going to bring a reprieve from the snakes, but there's something that he wants him to do first. He says, I want you to take a large, tall pole, Moses, and around the top of it, I want you to fashion and wrap a bronze snake. And I want you to take that tall snake up on that pole, and I want you to set it up at the front of the camp. And just tell the people that if they would just look at the snake, they would instantly be healed. And that, of course, is precisely what happens. And God brings this amazing salvation in the hearts and minds and lives of the people in the, uh, um, uh, just by looking at the snake. Now, what's the story there? What's the meaning of that right there? Don't you find it interesting? And it's funny, I never thought about this until I was studying it years ago. But I remember thinking this was strange even reading as a child. Why a snake? Why is it that the Jewish people were told to look up and identify with the very thing that was their problem. The snakes were their problem, yet they're told to look up at a snake. <laughs> In other words, it's almost as if God is saying to them, what I need you to understand is that the poison that is pumping through your veins is nothing compared to the poison that is pumping through your hearts. And until you look up and realize that one must bear that and identify with that and see that it would bear your curse, then there can be no hope of you and I having presence, having a presence together, being in the same fellowship with one another. And David, as he's looking at it and sees the sacrifices and understands the meaning of the ark, he gets it. And in that moment, though he's looking through a glass darkly, as it were, we believe that David saw Jesus. He saw what Jesus was going to become on his behalf, even though it was through a glass darkly. That's how David entered in, because he understood the absolute necessity of sacrifice. Okay, so that leaves the question. That's how David entered in. <laughs> how can we enter in? You know, I think this is a question for us to, to, to pose to all of ourselves, to make this morning worth it. <laughs> Have you entered through David's path? Have you entered in? Have you discovered what David discovered? Because if you're going to, I think there's going to be two things that have to happen. If you're going to enter in the way in which David did, you're going to first of all have to identify with Jesus. And secondly, you're going to have to put your faith in him. I want to unpack that in the couple minutes that we have remaining this morning. First of all, we have to identify with Jesus. The writer of the book of Hebrews would say, look, the blood of bulls and goats... That never actually atoned for anybody. But the sacrifice of Jesus, once for all, that's the only thing that can bring true salvation. In other words, what we have to say in the midst of this is say the only possible way, the only way that I will get to the presence of God that two weeks ago we said is the only thing that I can really have to survive this life and the next, the only way to that is going to be through the knowledge and identification of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. There is no knowing God without knowing Jesus. And as obvious as this sounds, <laughs> you've you, you, you got to recognize that it's entirely possible to have information about Jesus, but still be far from him. It is possible to know that Jesus is a substitute, but do you see him as your substitute? Look, the identification that we have with Christ at the cross is so profound that Christ has to carry our very identity with him on the cross. We have to look to him just like those Israelites looked up at the snake. The dynamics that were in place between the Jews looking up at the snake must be true of us as we spiritually and, and, and in our imaginations look to Jesus. What does that mean? Because don't you understand that the cross screams to us the two things that we need. The cross is screaming, I am holy, says God. What kind of holiness would cause the death of the Son of God? But at the very same time, it screams the boundlessness of the grace of God. What kind of grace would allow his son to be killed on his people's behalf? And that's the reason why when, when Jesus dies on the cross, the most important thing that happens is the curtain in the temple 
miraculously splits from top to bottom. Showing what? Now God is coming out. The presence of God has been released through what Jesus did. So how do we do that? I think this is the way. You begin to name your sin. In other words, you begin to start to work through your life and say, what is the one thing that either prior to my coming to Christ or still seems to beleaguer me after my coming to Christ? What is the one thing that I think about, man, if I could just get rid of that, if that wasn't true of me, I would so fully sense the presence and grace of God. Name it. What is it? Because until you see, identify with Jesus as being that for you, it's not going to mean anything to you that he died and rose again. Do you follow this logic? <laughs> In other words, until I look up at Jesus and see him being lust, until I see him being pride, hatred, jealousy, until I see him being gossip, until I see Jesus being racism, until I see Jesus being sexist, until I see him being heartless and loveless, it will never mean anything that God killed him for it. And every time I would have this conversation with students, they would stop me and say, this sounds blasphemous. I'm like, yes. First of all, notice the Bible says that he, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Did not say to be sinful for us. Jesus was never sinful. But Jesus became sin in that God said, I'm going to treat my son as if he had done all the things that you've been doing from the very beginning of your life until now. Oh, and by the way, that you'll ever commit unto, from here to your death. <laughs> and I'm going to treat him the way in which you should be treated. And in that way, you have identified with him. The great Protestant reformer Martin Luther said it this way, this is a singular consolation for all Christians. So to clothe Christ in our sins, <laughs> to wrap him in my sins and your sins, and so behold him, that's how Luther says it, to behold him bearing all of our iniquities. Our most merciful Father sent His only Son into the world and laid upon Him the sins of all men, saying, Be thou Peter, that denier, Paul, that persecutor and cruel oppressor, David, that adulterer, that sinner who ate of the fruit of the tree in the garden, the thief who hung upon the cross, and the person who considered all kinds of sins, and see thou therefore that you pay and satisfy for all of them. That's how we identify with him. We find out what it is that is plaguing me. And I wrap him, I wrap Jesus in Jesus with what's plaguing me. And all of a sudden when you find out when, that his God has forsaken him, you realize he's bearing your forsakenness. That's how we identify with Jesus. Only until you see him in your heart's imagination can we identify him. And that brings me to the last point of what it means to put our faith in him. Now you're ready. <laughs> because believing means that Christ becomes your life. He becomes the only thing that you really can be certain about. And because He is your life, He's your ground of faith. And good grief. If there was ever a topic that I found college students completely befuddled by, it was the idea of faith. What does it mean to believe? I just don't know if, um, if I'm believing right. What happens is we get so preoccupied with the nature of faith we forget about the object of faith, which is really what it's supposed to be focused on. I think we can say at least two things. First of all, we know that faith is not a work. Faith is not the work that we do to sort of get to heaven. Oftentimes I would speak to college students and I would say, you know, tell me, uh, you grew up in church. I certainly did. Really, so how are you doing spiritually speaking? For 25 years I can tell you that I can almost count on both hands. After hundreds, maybe thousands of conversations with college students. Then when I asked them about how they were doing spiritually, I would get a youth group, as wonderful as that is, uh, struggle with quiet times, church attendance. Can I tell you how rarely I ever like heard the name Jesus? <laughs> how is that possible? What is it that we are thinking in our midst this is about? <laughs> Because if somewhere in the midst of that conversation, it's not, Jesus is not somewhere in the conversation. Didn't I miss it? And people are like, oh, 
I guess a you know, preacher up there wants us to have all our theological ducks in a row before he asks us a question about where we are spiritually. No, I'm not. I feel like I just long for a time when someone says, you know, Les, how are you doing? That the answer would, that would come out of me was like, well, you know, I have some good days, I have some bad days, but, but I heard Jesus took care of all that. That's it. <laughs> That's what it means to place one's faith in Jesus because faith is not something that I conjure up so that I have enough. It's the means through which it comes to me. Our, our own denominational confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith, says this, that faith is the instrument of salvation. It's not the means or the cause of salvation. You've heard me say that it's a little bit like an, like an IV, an intravenous needle, right? Everybody's born with one. Everybody has this mechanism that, you, that from the beginning of your birth, you hook up to something. It's your life. It's your glue. It's that thing that you pride yourself upon. And Jesus is saying, yes, all those things are necessary, but until I am the ultimate source of your life, the one true center of where your spiritual IV is connected to, you don't understand what faith means. And for that reason, faith always leads us into a transformed life. Once that faith comes, what, what Luther would say is, salvation is by faith alone, but it is not by a faith that is alone. And now don't you understand why that's a matter of course? Of course. <laughs> Once I shift from making my life my career to actually being the grace of Jesus in the gospel, how can I not, be, how can I not change? The, the source of what I'm looking at has, has shifted. But what I want to make the point is, is that order is everything. Grace first, then a life of grace. Acceptance first, then transformation. Change of status before change of character. Christianity, it's everything. More about that next week. In closing, I came across a really interesting study done by some uh, psychologists about 16 years ago uh, because they wanted to see whether the body would respond not only to, to like actual physical stimulus, but from the imagination. So they put people in these sort of uh, encased rooms, and they had an infrared pupil tracker. Seriously, this is an amazing experiment. Pupil tracker. And what they would do is they would ask the subjects to imagine a bright, sunny beach. Just imagine it. Get a very vivid mental picture of a bright, sunny beach. You know what their pupils would do? They, 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 would, they would close up, just like they were outside. Then they would look and say, now I want you to imagine that you're in a very dark, sort of enclosed room. You know what their pupils would do? They would open up. But the situation in the room stayed exactly the same. What was the point? In our imaginations, our bodies will follow our imaginations. That's what we're saying. Once Jesus is fixed in the center of my imagination, change begins to happen. There's a response. One of my favorite theologians presently working is James K.A. Smith. He said that during the Enlightenment, man became known as homo sapiens, which in Latin means uh, uh, um, like one who thinks. But he said, actually, I think that's not the way it should go. We actually should be homo liturgicus, like one who worships. That's who you are. That's what drives us. And when all of a sudden Jesus gets held up, just like King David, we walk into his presence and he becomes everything. That's the good news in the Ark of the Covenant. Let's pray. And Lord Jesus, would you bring us through that same transformation so that we might know it similarly? We need to see you. Father, we, we oftentimes wonder what it means to see you in context like we're in. How do we do that? How do we access you? We pray that we would see in what you did with King David and the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, that you would bring us into that. Would you do that this morning? Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing our closing hymn. The sands of time are seeking The dawn of heaven breaks The sun Oh,
It's always so good to see your faces. Just two more weeks, y'all. One more week here. We look forward to seeing you next week before we enter into the new building after that. Uh, if you're willing to stick around and help us wipe down the uh, surfaces of the building uh, to help the 930 service, um, our Shannon is going to be outside at the kitchen area to help some wipe down stuff. And make sure you're on your way out, you grab one of our little photos of the church that uh, Eden Flora did for us. But in the meantime, receive this good word from Jeremiah 32. Now may the one who sent his own, his own with the power to save from guilt and darkness in the grave, who was, who, who's, and whose was mercy and truth, May he never stop doing you good, and may he inspire you to fear him so that you will never turn aside from him. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace.